get fired up. Ready to go. Fired up. Ready to go. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, NAACP. Now let's have a round of applause for Dr. Brenda Williams. You know, one of the blessings of being in this job is getting to travel this country and meet some of the greatest people in it. And when I met Dr. Brenda Williams, so moved. You know, she is a medical doctor in rural South Carolina, and she and her husband have spent, who's also a doctor, didn't just move back to their community, but they fight for the people of their community. They have spent hundreds of their hours and thousands of their dollars hiring lawyers to help their medical patients get the voter IDs they need, just in case, and we know this won't happen, but just in case Governor Haley has her way in the Supreme Court. But that ain't going to happen. And so if anybody is asking you if we are running voter ID drives across and say, yes, we are. Yes, we are, even in rural South Carolina. Well, my name is Benjamin Todd Jealous. I'm the proud dad of a new baby boy, born on the 4th of July, Jackson Epperson Todd Jealous. In case any of y'all are wondering, yes, Jackson is a family name. Morgan actually named him. She's quite proud of that. And like his sister Morgan, thanks to Mama Dukes, he is now a sixth generation member of the NAACP and the newest and youngest life member of this association. Like all of us today, I'm here because I'm proud to be part of the greatest nonviolent army for freedom and justice the world has ever known. Thank you, Chairman Brock, Vice Chair Russell, and the entire NAACP Board of Directors for all you do to steward this great organization. Thank you, Chairman Duffy, Vice Chair Maxwell, and the entire SCF Board of Trustees for all you do to resource the fight. And to the board of the crisis and the voter fund for all you do to bring the fight to the people. And now will Gary Bledsoe of the Texas State Conference please stand up? And President Reginald Lilly of the Houston branch and all of our state conference presidents. All of them, please stand up. And all of our branch presidents and our youth and college presidents, will you, all of you please stand up? Let's give them our loudest round of applause. These are the folks who are on the front lines, leading battles across this country, winning battles untold and deeply necessary. Because of you we and people like you, we have been great for 103 years, and we will keep on being great until the job is done. You've heard a lot of talk about these game changers. We at the NAACP have the privilege because we've been winning battles for 100 years to think long term. In fact, we have a responsibility to think long term. Because our founders, when they said that this country would end lynch mob justice, thought long term. Folks left them foolish in a parlor in New York City talking about ending lynch mob justice. It took us 60 years, but we did it. And then our greatest lawyer, Charles Hamilton Houston, got some folks together and they said, you know what? We're going to end Jim Crow. That one was rather quick. It took us 32 years and we did it. And then people like Medgar Evers and his fellow, his fellow state field director, Vernon Jordan and Georgia got together in the wake of Brown versus Board and said, we will make sure that black men and black women win city council presidencies, win school board presidencies, and even win the presidency of the United States. And it took them over 50 years, but we broke that color barrier too.
And so I want us to be clear as we look at these five game changers that they come up from the field and battles we are fighting in communities across this country. That these dreams to see the end of mass over incarceration, the end of mass under education, the end of the great health disparities that divide our nation and kill children and their parents and grandparents, the end of this country being a land of opportunity for some and suffering for others. And the final end of these ongoing battles to suppress the vote. When we mention those dreams, they may not be a one-year plan or a three-year plan or a five-year plan, but they are a plan that will happen. Because of the strength of this organization is that we have never in 103 years had to ask the question if we will win. We have only asked the question when we will win. Because we are willing to go the distance until we win. And for that, we have batted a thousand for 103 years and we ain't going to stop batting a thousand now. Brothers and sisters, I am proud to report that the state of the NAACP is strong and getting stronger every day. In the past three years, we have increased membership three years in a row, first time in over 20 years that we have done that. In the past four years, our online activists have grown from a little over 175,000 to now more than 650,000. Our Facebook followers have grown from 5,000 to 135,000. And this year, it ain't even August yet, and we have already registered 75,000 people to vote, put it into the van system, added that to the more than 530,000 we already have registered and in the van system, and we will push up towards one million before we get to November. And at the same time, and you know, my 95-year-old grandmother is one of these folks. At the same time, those, those faithful who, write, who claim their membership, took out their life membership, and turned around and write checks and donation to the NAACP every single year. We've seen that grown from 16,000 people writing checks and donation four years ago to more than 125,000 writing checks and donation every year today. <laughs> And I am proud to report that for the last four years, we have been in the black every year and grown our resources every year right through the recession. And we have been rewarded for our hard work. When the Tea Party said they were going to take over a school board in Wake County, North Carolina, we introduced them to a different plan different plan called high quality constitutional universal public education for everybody and they lost in every single school board district this last time around including the so-called conservative district we closed down two coal plants in chicago that topped our list of environmental justice offenders shut down prisons, including in states here like Texas, that's online to shut down its first prison ever. Work with allies on both sides of the aisle to introduce policies that are shifting us from failed tough on crime policies. Allies like Governor of Connecticut, Daniel P. Malloy. And if we tell the truth, you know, those, while he will never sign an anti-death penalty bill, Rick Perry, the Texas State Conference, helped push the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition to, tie, to, to sign 12 progressive criminal justice reforms this fall. Yeah, we can clap for that. No permanent friends, no permanent enemies, enemies just permanent interests. That includes Rick Perry. It does. And we have won key battles in, against employment discrimination and discrimination in lending. And as we do all of that, we are preparing today to launch a national crusade to pull the black church fully in with the NAACP to end the scourge of the virus called HIV. 
And we are also announcing today that the chairman of our corporate campaign isn't just the first African American to be the chairman of our corporate campaign, the first HIV survivor to be the chairman of our corporate campaign, but also the first former youth and college president to be the chairman of our corporate campaign, and that is none other than Magic Johnson himself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these are tough times in our democracy. Our democracy is literally under attack from within. We have wealthy interests like the Koch brothers seeking to buy elections, and when that ain't enough, suppress the vote. And to be honest, each and every one of us is on the front line, that new front line our chairman talks about, every single day. From redistricting, from redistricting battles in states like Georgia, to fighting attacks on voter suppression across the country, and literal government takeovers by governors in states like Michigan. There is no battle more important or urgent to the NAACP right now than the battle to preserve our democracy itself. Let me be very clear. Our right to vote is the right upon which our ability to defend every other right is leveraged. And while you might count yourself as an education person or a health person or a criminal justice person or an economic development person, you can be all of those, but you won't win on any of those if we let our votes go. Today I would like to give special acknowledgement to our activists in Florida, to our voting rights workers and our voter registration volunteers in Florida who risked exorbitant fines, threats of jail time for registering people to vote. Indeed, as far as we can tell, who are the only representatives of any major national organization who kept on registering people to vote in the face of those threats. And throughout all of that kept Florida as one of our most productive centers of voter registration in the country. People ask me why the NAACP just won't back down when states get high in states like Florida or Georgia or so many other places. And I tell them that we act differently because we is different. We have endured the martyrdom of more of our leaders than any other civic organization in this country and when you take out political parties like the ANC, possibly in the world. We know their names. Indeed, many of us knew them personally, loved them, were led by them. And we honor their memory by not just seeking to emulate their courage in our lives, but in continuing to defend and extend the very democracy they gave their lives for. Many didn't find it coincidental that in the midst of this latest assault on voting rights in Florida, we found ourselves marking the 60th anniversary of the assassination of Harry and Harriet Moore, Christmas Eve, when white supremacists packed dynamite to the roof of the floorboards under their bedroom and blew them up. In the midst of a massive voter registration drive and the investigation of a lynching and we call it the Sunshine, the sunshine State. This fall, as we push to do everything we can do to encourage people to vote, we are also preparing to mark the 50th anniversaries of the assassination of Medgar Evers in Jackson. If you're wondering where the Jackson came from, Jackson, Mississippi, as well as the murders of four little girls when white supremacists blew up the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Little Miss Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, 
Carol Robertson, and Denise McNair. This year, we carried pictures of these martyrs and others in marches to the North Carolina State Capitol where voting rights were under attack, to the South Carolina State Capitol where voting rights were under attack, to the Alabama State Capitol in Montgomery, and even, and Brenda Williams was there, even the UN itself. Because we are committed to defending the freedoms they died seeking to secure for future generations, and we are also con committed to ensuring that future generations know who exactly died for their rights, what their names were. I mentioned the special role that we play in defending our democracy and the martyrs who we remember for the sacrifices made in that struggle for three reasons. One, we are living through the greatest wave of legislative assaults on the right to vote in more than a century. In 2011 and 2012, we saw more states pass more laws, pushing more voters out of the ballot box than in any legislative cycle in more than a century. Second, I mention it because we must understand what those who are attacking our rights understand. Our voting rights are the right upon which our ability to defend all of our other rights is leveraged. And if you let someone diminish the power of your vote, you will have already lost a battle that you will wake up one day to, to feeling like was more important than that voting rights battle and realize in that instance that you lost that battle that you really cared about when you lost the voting rights battle. Voters in Mississippi, voters who turned out and stood with us to end, to make sure that birth control wasn't outlawed when the, by the passing of the so-called personhood bill, and then turned around and voted against us, passing a voter ID measure, will figure out one day that we should have stu stuck together on both. And I'm proud to say that Planned Parenthood and National Organization of Women and, and others are committed to making sure that that never happens again. Now, unless you need any more convincing on the point, I would that one fight is connected to the other fight. I would introduce you, if you haven't met them, to the organization known as the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. I'll talk more about them later. But ALEC, as it assaults the right to organize, as it pushes, stand, has pushed in your ground laws, as it has pushed to pass the meanest, most racist immigration laws we have ever seen, has pushed voter suppression laws three dozen states across this country. One greases the skids for the other. Finally, we must focus on defending our democracy because for 103 years, we at the NAACP have focused on pushing America towards that great providence described by Frederick Douglass in his speech, Our Composite Nationality, his, his tirade against the Chinese Exclusion Act, the SB 1070 of his day, when he said the destiny of America is defined by its geography, unique in the world, bordered by oceans on two sides, and nations of different colors on either end, to be the greatest example of human unity that the world has ever seen. See, we say that we followed W.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells and Mary White Ovington, but they followed Frederick Douglass. Let us make this clear. Let us make sure that each of us understand what our ancestors like Frederick Douglass understood. Our community... When our community's voting rights are attacked, as the, as the voting populace becomes browner and blacker, 
when we see the forces of regression seeking to push immigrants of color out of the country as the country becomes browner and blacker. This is the flip side of the strategy by the would-be oligarchs in this country to buy our democracy wholesale because they understand that the great coalition for justice in this country has always been people of color and poor white folks and people of good conscience of all colors. And they cannot defeat us democratically. So they have to defeat us by hook and by crook and by voter suppression and by buying votes and by pushing out children who have lived their entire lives in this country, who know no country but this country, and but for a piece of paper. They would deny them not just their, in order to deny them their ability to vote, they would deny them their very citizenship. We will ensure that our nation continues to practice free and fair elections. We will ensure that our nation continues to follow the creed etched into the Statue of Liberty itself. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. And we will ensure that the opportunity to run for office and represent your community re remains open to all of our nation's children, rich or poor, black or white, and that our elected representatives are beholden to the people who voted for them and not the oligarchs who invested in them. Because we still define people as people the way it was defined by the abolitionists who victorious push for the 14th Amendment and not as Chief Justice Roberts and Citizens United so creatively misinterpreted the word people as to include corporations. Memo to Justice Roberts. We will concede that corporations are people too when your court treats one of them like Troy Davis and lets a state like Georgia or Texas wrongfully execute one. Now in 2008, the nation saw the same thing. We saw the largest, most diverse electorate in the history of presidential politics. But the country didn't respond in the same way. Some of us said, oh yes, finally, finally we are approaching that day that Frederick Douglass prophesied the greatest example of human unity of the world has ever seen. And some of us said, oh no, we are finally realizing what Frederick Douglass prophesied, the greatest example of human unity of the world, has ever, that is bad for us. So let's divide and let's split and let's pull the most powerful playbook of voter suppression that we have off the shelves where it's been for a hundred years. And rather than breaking the law to suppress the vote, we will use the law to suppress the vote. But let us be clear, the most that those forces of evil can ever hope for is to hold off the future a cycle or two more. See, you can hold off the future a little bit, but the future's going to catch up with you. The future's going to catch up with you. And we at the NAACP for 103 years have made it our specific business to hasten the arrival of the future and a better day for all of America's children. And we're still here on the battlefield, winning important victories, turning the tide towards common sense and righteousness every day. Right now, in this moment, with 120 days left until the election, we have a choice to make. We can allow this election, Jerry Mondesire, to be stolen in advance, as a politician from Pennsylvania recently bragged about when he thought no one was listening, talking about his state's voter ID law. Or we can double down on democracy and overcome the rising tide of voter suppression with a higher tide of voter registration and mobilization and activation and protection. While the challenge is significant, 
let us be clear that we have overcome more significant hurdles before. While it will require sacrifice, let us be clear we have witnessed even greater sacrifices before. So in this year, we must each be prepared to make great sacrifices of our time and our talent and our treasure. We must be prepared to defend voting rights and defend our democracy and turn out voters on every corner and at every ballot box so that we can overcome those who would otherwise seek to buy our country wholesale. I wish everyone in the audience could have the view that I have from here right now. See so many faces of champions of voting rights and voter participation and people who are winning victories right now. Folks like our leaders from North Carolina and Michigan who have convinced governors to veto voter ID laws and even organize an override in North Carolina and got a Republican governor to veto strict voter ID bills in Michigan. Our leaders from states like Texas, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Florida who have helped convince the Department of Justice to attack some of the nation's most outrageous new voter suppression efforts, such as the law in this state that sought to allow you to vote using your gun license, but youth in college is not your student ID. And great freedom fighters like Kemba Smith, who is here with us today, who traveled with us to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva this spring to speak on behalf of the millions of formerly incarcerated people in this country for whom voting rights continue to be denied based on Jim Crow era statutes like that in her home state and my family's home state of Virginia, which a delegate to that state's constitu constitution in 1906 where it was embedded into the state constitution where it still stands said plainly because of this plan the darky will be eliminated as a factor in our state's politics. As long as that law is there, we will fight that law until we eviscerate that law. Because while history may have forgotten why it has put, was put there in the first place, the NAACP has not. <laughs> Last Wednesday, you know, excuse me, I haven't slept in like a week. I don't know if you remember what the first week of a new baby is like. But I apparently had forgotten, which is why we have one. <laughs> and and I, was, I was holding my little baby boy there, cradling him on my arms on Independence Day. And it occurred to me, and I'm not the first father in my family to be there with his wife as she gave birth to a baby boy on the 4th of July. The first was my granddad's grandfather, a man named Burl Todd, who had been born a slave in 1849. And like me, he had a baby boy when he was about 40 in 1889, named Edward Jerome Todd Sr. Now, I didn't know my great-grandfather, Edward Jerome Todd Sr., who was born in 1889, but I knew his son, my grandfather, Edward Jerome Todd Jr., Jerome Jr., they said, was a lot like Jerome Sr. I guess through one I knew the other. He was a hard-working man. He was a patriot. He had spent 30 years on law enforcement in Baltimore. And he was a man of very few words. In fact, I can remember one of the last conversations I ever had with him. He was approaching his 90th birthday, and I was packing up, preparing to head to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. We were wrapping up Fourth of July festivities at his house, and I was getting in my car heading to D.C. and then off to England a couple weeks later, and this would be the last time I saw him. And I had my bag on my shoulder, and he looked at me, and he said, Grandson, stood there in his driveway, he said, Grandson, you know, if I had this life to live all over, I would leave this country when I was young, and I would never come back. And I said, trying to break the tension of the sadness, Granddad, where would you have gone? And he said, Jamaica, Ghana, Paris. I heard Tina Turner likes Paris.
despite his patriotism, despite his long and dis distinguished career as a public servant in Baltimore, his experience as a black man, as a person of color in this country, had resigned him after 90, uh, almost 90 years in this country to the notion that no matter how much he loved his country, his, never, his country would never love him back quite as much. And as I sat there last week cradling my newborn son in my arms and remembering the saddest conversation I ever had with my grandfather, this son of a black man born on the 4th of July, I recommitted myself to winning the fight against racism in this country before it can break my son's heart, let alone his son's heart. And the fight against poverty itself and the fight against all the walls of division that cut up this land that's supposed to be the greatest example of human unity the world has ever seen. In this nation of laws, not of men, where our birthright is defined by our constitution, not the communities we come from. Let us honor the memory of our grandparents and great-grandparents who sacrificed so much to get us to where we are right now, where we can worry about losing so much. Let us honor them by recommitting to the fight for freedom and adopting the rallying cry of our troops, Reverend Barber, in North Carolina. Forward ever, and not one step back. Forward ever, not one step back. Forward ever, not one step back. Let us recognize that while our children may be born on any day of the year, their rights were born on the 4th of July. Our forefathers recognized the truth that stand for all humanity, whether, them some, whether some of them realize it or not. And they put down the most powerful words any group, any group of politicians have ever written. Our Creator has, denied, our creator has endowed each of us with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are words that put into motion the greatest and ongoing human rights struggle that the world has ever known. And so at this historic juncture, at this crossroads of history, when we are blessed to know that the direction of our nation is literally our choice, it's literally our power, our decision, and our vote. Let us each internalize that which W.E.B. Du Bois admonished us in a memo to the staff in 1946 that we must be nonpartisan in our allegiance and bipartisan in our aggression. That we do not owe allegiance to any candidate because they share our party, let alone our color, but because they share our principles and our conscience. Ask Alan West what I'm talking about. Sorry. Couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Sorry, Congressman West. Which is why, which is why we worked our state leaders and national staff to make sure that we coordinate, our folks on the ground understand this in their soul, that we coordinate with people on the left and the right when they are willing to do the right thing. We worked with Governor Malloy, a former prosecutor in, in Connecticut, to abolish the death penalty and began keeping our promise to Troy Davis. But we also have worked with Governor Nathan Deal, Tea Party member and Republican, who just signed into law the most sweeping review of existing state-level criminal justice legislation any state has ever done in the country. See, he's also the father of a drug court judge. And the Tea Party includes libertarians and fiscal conservatives and Christian evangelicals who all understand that when our nation has gotten to the point where we incarcerate black men at a rate five times higher than South Africa did at the, at the height of apartheid, and white men merely at the level that South Africa incarcerated black men at the height of apartheid, this is a crisis of moral conscience that we cannot afford to be partisan about. We found common ground with Virginia's Republican Governor Bob McDonnell, who shut down prison and called for more money to be sent to universities. 
And here in Texas, the state conference, as I mentioned earlier, working under the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, helped push Rick Perry himself to sign 12 progressive criminal justice reforms that have led to this state announcing it will shut down its first prison in its entire history. And just this past week, we worked with Re Republican Governor Rick Snyder, who became the first Republican, and we expect not the last, to veto a strict photo ID, voter identification law. These developments have hastened the day when our game changers will be achieved. They also speak to the real possibility of true bipartisan cooperation in these otherwise highly fractious and partisan times. Of course, we also have certain principles that we will never compromise. And we are bipartisan in our aggression to protect them. The mission of the NAACP is to ensure the educational, political, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. This is the standard by which we hold every issue that we take on. These are the values that guided the creation of our game changers, and that's why and may our board of directors, under the leadership of our fierce and courageous chairman, Rosalind Brock, made a stand for marriage equality. <laughs> civil, matter, civil marriage is a civil right and a matter of civil law, period, end of story. This is not about rights, R-I-T-E-S, it is about rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. We will defend the right of your church or your temple or your synagogue or your mosque to practice whatever you want to practice, to marry whoever you want to marry. But we will also defend the right of every citizen of this country not to be discriminated against by a judge or a justice of the peace or a county clerk because of what God made them, their race, their creed, their color, their sexual orientation, or their gender. Simply put, the NAACP will never stand by as any state tries to encode discrimination into law. As, Mar as Amos Brown has often recommended us, his teacher, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mr. Bond's teacher, that one course he ever taught was always very clear, right now is always the right time to do the right thing. Simply put, we do not waver attempts, waver in fighting attempts to encode discrimination. That's why we're telling Nikki Haley of South Carolina, Rick Scott of Florida, Rick Perry of Texas, and any other governor who set their sights on the Voting Rights Act. We would remind you that there was a reason why Congress reauthorized it with such great bipartisan support. We played a big right in getting them, we played a big role in getting them to do so. And we look forward to you being shocked again, as shocked as you were last week when Congress up upheld the Affordable Health Care Act, when the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Health Care Act. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm a new daddy. I haven't slept. When the Supreme Court upholds the Voting Rights Act, including Section 5. And it's in the same spirit of of fighting discrimination, of fighting racism, of fighting attempts to turn back the clock in this country, that I want to thank the more than 70,000 people, members of labor, SEIU, AFL-CIO, members of churches and synagogues and mosques, members of more than 30 LBGT organizations, student organizations, and more than 300 organizations all in total who showed up to accept my invitation to celebrate Father's Day at Mayor Bloomberg's house. <laughs> to Ray Kelly, that notorious commissioner of the NYPD, who fought against stop and frisk when it was created under Giuliani and then flipped when he became a servant of Mayor Bloomberg. Let me be very clear. The march was just the beginning. 
This time we came silently to your boss's house. Next time we will come. We may not be so silent and it may be at your place of work. You see, when under your administration you have taken stop and frisks of young people in the city from less than 100,000 to almost 800,000, that's what our pace to do this year. When 90% of those young people are innocent, they don't even get a ticket. When 90% are people of color, when 99% don't have a gun, and that's what you justify this on in the first place, 99.9% .9 don't have a gun. Ain't nothing to mend. It needs to be ended. And Turner Clayton, Sanford, Florida, I may need you to come up to New York City to join the next protest. Because if Commissioner Kelly, Mama Dukes, insists on making himself the Bull Connor of the 21st century, if he continues to stand his ground on stop and frisk, then we're going to have to do him like we did Bill Lee down in Sanford. And that is why I say to you that the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, who has so efficiently replicated scan your ground laws around this country, voter suppression methods from coast to coast, the blood of every adult and child who is wrongfully killed because of these laws is on your hands. And if it comes to pass that we find that this election was stolen in advance the way that that politician in Pennsylvania believes it already has been, then we will sh ensure that the shame is placed squarely on your shoulders, too. <laughs> she said, do it. And so to our friends at Johnson & Johnson and Walmart who have stopped supporting Alex since our board requested that they do so, we say thank you. And to our friends, leading corporations across this country who are still considering our humble request, we encourage you to just do it. Because while we welcome informed and robust debate, there are some lines that should never be crossed by any responsible member of our great civil society. And when an organization supports measures that push voters out of the ballot box by the millions, as Alec has done with voter suppression laws in more than three dozen states, when organizations push laws that license ordinary citizens to racially profile with, le with lethal force, as Alec has done in replicating Florida's Stand Your Ground law across the country. And when your organization helps promote laws that legalize the greatest legislative assault on immigrants of color, and when they start asking Canadians to show their papers, I will say all immigrants. But I haven't heard of anybody stopping somebody in Alabama for looking mighty Canadian recently. I don't think Justin Bieber will be worried about holding his next, his next concert there. The greatest legislative assault on the immigrants of color since the Chinese Exclusion Act itself. Then I would say that this country that pushed, that this organization that pushes voter suppression, that pushes stand your ground laws, that pushes racist laws to literally force our brown brothers and sisters back across our southern border, has crossed at least three lines too many. And when you cross a line with the NAACP, we are not quick to forget. And so we will keep our principles in mind as we look to the future and prepare to win three battles in the next year. You see, in January, we will, in states across this country, gather in state capitals across this country, ready to push and win victories in each of our game-changer areas, get prepared to get back our voting rights, prepared to ensure that health care 
and the Affordable Health Care Act reaches every citizen that it should. Shift our misplaced priorities in this country back from incarceration towards education. And ensure that payday lending becomes a thing of the past. But before that is December, when our nation will have an epic battle in which we intend to see the end of the Bush tax cuts. And beyond that, the restoration of an economy in which everybody can finally work for a fair wage and everybody who has a job, let alone the most high-paying jobs, pays their fair share. But before we get to January, before we get to December, we got to deal with November itself. And as I said before, we must be prepared, we must be working hard, we must go back with gusto. I don't want to hear anybody saying, oh, so-and-so wasn't there, or I haven't gotten my t-shirts yet, or where's my stipend? Unless you can show me the chapter and verse where Dr. King delayed the march over the Selma Bridge for an order of t-shirts, I need you to recognize that we are back in Selma to Montgomery Times. And we need you on the battlefield with a heart on fire for justice and a soul that won't quit till we get it. We must overwhelm the rising tide of voter suppression with a higher tide of registration and mobilization and motivation and protection. And the only people we can count on to do it are you who are here right now to go back and lead your troops in the field. As I think about these challenges in the next year, my, my thoughts and Evelyn turned back to my little son, Jack. You saw him up there. He was, he was quite cute. Was quite cute. <laughs> I ain't going to get a fight saying he's the cutest baby, but, but that's how I feel. <laughs> Diedrich, Chantel, there's a whole bunch of folks who'd be on my front door. And money. No. I have the key. Yes, like you, you do. In your house, he's the cutest baby. In my house, he's the cutest baby. So, let me turn back to Jack. You know, for any parent, the birth of a new child brings up questions, old questions, cause you to pause and reflect on the world into which he is born, and your responsibility, your sense of urgency to make it better. Will they come to, will the world they come to know be one in which they can prosper and grow? We ask ourselves, will the America they grow up in allow them to realize all the dreams and aspirations they dare to dream? You know, as I said to you a couple of years ago, that distance between a child's aspirations and a parent's situation is the exact measurement of that family's level of frustration. And our job is to close that gap. That's what winning all these game changers is about. You can't just win on one of these game changers and turn around the situation of our families across the country. They're like the five fingers of the hand. They're all interconnected. And the world won't work right unless we move them all, unless we close that gap on age, we close that gap on education, we close that gap the economy, we close that gap in justice, so many other fronts. And most importantly, in my household, thinking about my granddad and where this country left him in his last days, will they come to feel that no matter how much they love their country, the country will always love them back a little less? I have spent many hours reflecting on these questions, questions similar to those that all parents ask themselves, questions I'm certain that Tracy and Sabrina asked themselves as they held little Trayvon Martin in their arms. And sadly, I say, like many of you, and certainly as Tracy and Sabrina are entitled to feel, I've come to face the harsh reality that in this great nation, Mama Dukes, there exists a deep and troubling paradox, a conundrum of epic proportions. You see, the sad reality is that if we simply accept things as they are and allow those who wish to turn back the clocks and the tides of all that we have gained and block the forward movement 
of our movement for human rights that if we simply stay idle and watch the game rather than change the game, that if we allow America's dream and America's promise to be denied to too many of America's children, we will have failed in our mission and our calling. I don't know about the rest of America, but I'm deeply disturbed by the fact that in this great nation, a nation founded on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that in a nation whose founding text echoed the ideals of democracy and justice, there lies the troubling reality that our children's lives will be worse off than the generation before them. Well, NAACP, I've come here to tell you today on short leave of absence from Leah and the baby and Morgan, that this is the time to shift the nation's priorities, time to shift away from priorities rooted in fear and towards those motivated in love and the ideals of the country we aspire to be. You know, the truth of our nation is this, if you look at state budgets over the last 30 years. We love our children a lot. That's why we spend a lot of money on education. But the only thing that trumps our love for our own children is our fear of somebody else's. And we must get back to the place that, um, where America treats all, in fact, find the place we never quite have been, where America treats all of her children as all of her children. There is much at stake and far too much for us to give up now. And even now, when the forces that seek to divide us appear to outnumber us, let us be reminded, Reverend Brock, and you were Reverend Brock last night. <laughs> we had Chairman Brock this morning. We had Reverend Brock last night. Let us be reminded, Reverend Brock and all the other reverends in the house, of the great prophet, Elisha. Reverend Hope, like all of us in this, rev in this room today, Elisha was sent to preach the truth. But the powerful kings of the land did not like what he had to say. And so they, like the powerful interests of today, unleash unleashed a mighty army to defeat him. Surrounded by his enemy, Elisha's servant looked out the window. Overwhelmed with the many men he saw, he resigned that they had surely lost the battle. But unmoved by the numbers set out to destroy him, Elisha raised his voice and proclaimed, Open his eyes, God, open his eyes. Let him see that there are more with us than against us. See, Vice Chairman Russell, Elisha knew something about the 99%. And I remind you again, as I reminded us last year, we must always see ourselves, see ourselves as giants, not as grasshoppers. G giants in this fight to build an America for all of her children, an America where no child nor their parents live on the margins of society, an America where our sons can walk freely in their neighborhoods, Skittles and iced tea in hand, hoodie on their head without fear of being harassed, embarrassed, or brought down by the billet of a suspicious police officer, community watchman, or neighbor. We must do this doggedly and, strategic and strategically, and we must, even when America seems to lose her way, we must resolve to be her conscience, and that conscience must have courage, and yes, we must ensure that it does not skip this generation. That courage, Chairman Brock, must never waver. And when the forces against us unleash all that they can, whether it be millions of dollars to suppress our votes or mass confusion meant to divide our nation, we must never retreat. And when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Let us lift up our eyes to the hills for which cometh, from which cometh all of our help. You can't see over the top of the hills. You've got to have faith that the troops are there. Those hills, those hills, we see them in our online activists. You don't see them in this room, but there's 650,000 people at the push of a button. And when the way gets weary and the fire hot, let us walk the path like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. When our backs are against the wall and the end seems near, let us keep our eyes on the prize like Daniel in the lion's den. For when we push America back to her ideals of life, 
liberty and justice for all, we make America stronger. And in doing so, we will build an America for all of our children. An America in which my baby boy Jackson, born on the 4th of July, unlike his great-grandfather years before him, will be able to stand tall and sing proudly without a lingering doubt. My country, tis of thee. When we build an America where all of our children have access to high quality, universal, constitutional, Reverend Barber, public education, my baby boy can proudly, can proudly proclaim sweet land of liberty. And when we build an America where economic justice and the great American dream can be re realized by all, he too can sing, of thee I sing. And when we build an America that moves beyond mere tolerance into a place where all her children, no matter from where they come, are truly embraced, he, can, he too can sing with pride rather than sadness, land where my fathers died. When we build an America free of racial discrimination, former chairman bond and hatred, and one rooted in justice and liberty, he too can sing land of the pilgrim's pride. When we build an America when every American can enjoy a high quality, affordable health care and an environment free of, so, of pollution, he too can sing from every mountainside. And when we build an America where we truly embody one person, one vote, he too can sing, let freedom ring. When we do this, I say when we do this, for when we do this, we push America back to her ideals of life, liberty, and justice for all. When we take America back to a true democracy of the people, by the people, and most importantly, for the people, we will make America stronger. We will make America stronger. We will make America stronger. Let us move America forward. Forwards ever. Backwards never. Forwards ever. Backwards never. Forwards ever. Backwards never. Until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. God bless the NAACP and God bless each of you. And God bless Jackson. there is just one movement in this country for human rights and we have always stood together in solidarity whenever our leaders have been most inspired and most clear and I want to be very clear this morning that there is a labor struggle here in Houston service employees international union and our thoughts are with them workers are here today I hope that each of you who's approached by them will take a time to listen to them it is important that we be very clear in this country that the prosperity of the black community has been made possible largely by the existence of unions and we support our brothers and sisters when they seek to organize. Thank you and God bless.